Right, so we're on to the, the last session, the final session here at day two of uh, Tech Live London. Could we have the, uh, sta uh, the chairs brought onto the stage, please? So our final session today is a panel, as I just said, and this is on data and analytics, something we've talked about extensively over the last couple of days. And uh, let me grab that. Okay, and joining me uh, to talk about this, uh, we have um, Alec Burr and Matt Murphy. Now, Alec is um, Associate Partner for AI and Automation Europe at Infosys Consulting. And Matt Murphy, who you may remember from yesterday, he's the Chief Data Officer from Nova Scotia Health. Please join me on the stage, guys. Thank you. Good to see you again. Please take a seat. Okay, so um, so Matt, turn to you first. Um, how does uh, cloud computing reduce the attack surface and guard data from bad actors? I sincerely hope you're joking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's the question I've got here. Um, Perhaps the audience would like to answer that. <laughs> or perhaps you'd like to ask me maybe about some of the challenges in scaling AI in healthcare. Let's talk about that, shall we? That's a fascinating idea. OK, go for it. Perfect. Thank you for that wonderfully queued up question. I legitimately thought you were joking at first, though. Um, so I am going to talk about the challenges of scaling AI in healthcare, and particularly in Canadian healthcare. So we, in Canadi or <laughs> Canada, in Canada, we are publicly funded. Uh, and work exclusively through government partners to develop and to deploy all aspects of our information management, information technology. And so within our, our service, developing models for machine learning in particular, we don't do a lot yet in deep learning and neural network. Uh, developing models is, is really easy in that we can, we can hire specific mathematicians, statisticians, uh, individuals with PhDs in computer science. And then we hit a government wall in terms of deployment. So the development of a pipeline from test to production is extraordinarily problematic for us. So being able to work through the various aspects of regulation and government red tape to move from a single model that's developed on-prem to then being able to actually move into full production in cloud now, I did pick up a lot of tips from different people throughout the last two days about how we might be able to work around some of that. But for us, some of the, the biggest issues with scaling AI is actually moving from development through to a pipeline to production. Uh, in Nova Scotia, again, I mentioned this yesterday, we, we have 41 different hospitals, 100 plus community sites. So we end up needing to build models specifically for individual sites. And again, moving those into a scalable cloud production environment is, is extraordinarily challenging from a regulatory perspective. Be interested to know if perhaps on the consulting side there is an answer. Yeah, I mean, in terms of what does it mean to, I guess, scale AI, um, I don't think really any, many organizations have actually done this to, to its fullest, um, even some of the big tech um, firms. But I think, you know, what does scaled AI mean to me? It, it really means actually it's, it's embedded within every sort of business process within an organization. Um, it's actually part and parcel of actually driving, um, I guess, business decisions within that organization, you know, because actually it can, it can do a lot to help, you know, predict things, optimize processes. But until that's really um, truly the case, I can, I, I can could never say that an organization is truly scaled. I mean, I've personally been overside, uh, overseen sort of over 100 different types of POCs, and, and there is a big challenge in terms of getting those things from that sandbox into a space of actually productionizing it. Um, um, so, you know, we, we flipped the way we do this um, um, over the last uh, sort of 18 months, and it's really, a, you know, it's about making sure that they can see that value, obviously, from, from what you saw in the previous um, uh, talk. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, we were just talking about ROI there when it comes to um, AI. Um, Alex, staying with you here, um, wh and what barriers exist, such as skills shortages, something else we've talked about um, extensively, and poor data management? How can companies begin to approach scaling AI when they're faced with those kind of barriers? Uh, I see 
I, I guess five kind of core pillars to some of the challenges. Um, one, yeah, is certainly data in terms of actually the management of data um, and really getting to you know data into more of a um, on the rails, you know, not you know going outside of that um, uh, that, you know, that sandbox environment and making sure that you've got the, the appropriate data to run the models that you're looking at. Um, a second part, as, it, as you mentioned in the question, is, is certainly around um, talent. Um, and really sort of building that um, uh, balance between you know, those that can do the, the wonderful things with regard to the data, the data scientists, as well as also you know, building that um, bridge to, to the business. As an organization, we, we, uh, we've, we've kind of flipped it a bit on the head with regard to that, that role of a data scientist. We now call them decision science scientists. It's really to just go and make sure that we are promoting the ability for them to better understand actually what's going on in the business so they can apply, apply that technology. Um, I guess the third element um, is really around actually customization. You know, there are, with all the cloud environments you've got, there's a lot of open source technologies you can use. Um, how do you better deploy those? It's not just a case of taking a, a, a model off the shelf. It's about making sure that obviously you can understand exactly what that model's doing so you can apply it appropriately. Um, um, and you know, really, you know, and even with some of the, the advances with regard to sort of low-code platforms, that helps with the, the talent side as well, because actually you can start to democratize uh, the, the technology to a certain degree. Um, I've got the fourth element, I guess, was very much around knowledge. Um, you know, how do you actually start to think about where you can use the technology in, in, a, in a business setting? Um, we very much, I very much think about it in terms of there's two sides to the AI coin. There's obviously the technology and there's the human side. So how do we better leverage the technology and driving up the understanding within business teams of actually how it, how can it be applied. Um, and I guess the last thing which, was um, which has been talked about already that, um, on this, um, uh, this event is around trust. Some of the biggest challenges are, even if you've got a model that's delivering some fantastic results, it's actually the trust within the organization to, to, to drive that in and actually put it into a, into a production environment. And actually they're where people will start to um, you know, believe in what actually the value it can deliver an organization. Yeah, Matt, this is something we talked about yesterday as well, um, like how you were building trust in the, in the data that, and uh, analytics that you are providing, especially in healthcare, where, where that trust is essential. Why don't you just tell us a bit about that? Yeah, so absolutely. And I, I think I would build off of what Alex has just said, particularly around understanding the model. And actually, we just had a little backstage chat about that. It's one of the big challenges right now with up and coming data scientists or, and I really like decision scientists. I think that I will take that home to Nova Scotia and pretend <laughs> I made it up. Uh, so in terms of building trust, like it is essential, right? So in order for people to actually uptake your analytics or uptake your, uptake your data and incorporate it into decision making, they have to trust both you and your product. Uh, and I think if we, for anybody who caught Aaron's presentation yesterday on confidence and conveying confidence in decision making, uh, it's more than just explaining to somebody that you are certain that the methodology you chose was right. When it comes to explaining AI or explaining the underlying analytics to be used in decision making, it is essential that you actually understand the methodology that you have chosen. You have to be able to explain to somebody in simplistic terms why you used Random Forest, why you used Monte Carlo, why you went with machine learning instead of neural network. and and you need to be able to do it without using any of those words. <laughs> so you need to be able to explain that you chose a specific approach to prediction. Um, you can draw parallels to the stock market and how you make forecasts. Everybody understands, you know, well, maybe not everybody, I understand sports betting. Uh, mm. So you can draw parallels and I think it is absolutely essential. Your end user has to trust you, which means you have to trust yourself and before you can trust yourself, you have to have a deep understanding of the methods that you're using. And if you don't, then you have to be comfortable to talk to your colleagues or to your boss and say, I chose this because I was taught to use this, but I think we actually, as a whole team, Sorry. you know, maybe need to do some soul searching about the degree to which we have in-depth knowledge of this particular area and whether we're ready to deploy it across an organization. And talking about trust there and coming back to the, the, the point you're making about what you, what you call yourselves, what you call your colleagues, why are we removing the word data from some of these job titles? Like even uh, Indipol Bandarai from uh, IBM yesterday, who's a chief data officer, he described himself now as a change agent. And change seems to be the, a key word that we keep hearing rather than data. So why are people scared of using the word data? 
Um, I mean, I think in terms of the context of why we, we've changed, you know, the you know, data scientist to a, to a um, decision scientist is very much just to help embed that thinking, the business thinking, you know, not expecting somebody, um, you know, to just rock up with a, an understanding of the various different models and, uh, and methods that they can approach a, a, a problem. But um, it's actually trying to think about actually how do we infuse this and really make sure that we can then get to a point of actually really driving efficiencies or optimizations for organizations and in, well, in, in a business sense, you know, think about a business process. I mean, at the top of, uh, of is talking about scaling AI. Nobody's really doing this, but how do you then make sure that you can get that more infused in the organizations? And data's always there. It's the, it's the elephant in the room. It's the thing that holds back, you know, um, getting things into production, you know, from, from that sandboxing. So um, I guess I guess the, the the essence is in terms of what you're talking about it is 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 around you know um, the I guess, different thoughts in terms of, um, and, um, and focuses within an organisation to get them to to try and think around actually how they can apply that in a business you know and it does obviously there are challenges with regard to change yeah um, you know, that's certainly that's a big element of the trust um, in terms of what does this mean for my job or my role um, okay well look you need to be a part and parcel of that. As an SME to help, you know, um, you know, be more explorative with regard to what AI can do in an organisation. Can I jump in on that? Yeah, of course. Cool. Because I think I would take a slightly different approach, and probably. So for me, it's, and I recognise that my title is still Chief Data Officer. So, mm -hmm. and I, and I'm about to try to draw a parallel to information, and I can't be a Chief Information Officer because I don't have the tech background. Uh, but for me, when I when I think about data, I think about like raw, unprocessed, unstructured information, uh, sorry, unstructured data. When I talk with my executive, when I talk with senior politicians, if I say data, they don't really think anything has happened with it yet. When I talk about information or actionable insight or decisioning, there's an underlying assumption that we have taken data, so raw numbers, raw text, whatever it is, and, and have done something to it. We have converted it into an insight that can then inform a decision. And so for me, I think one of the reasons people are scared of the term data is, it is it's ubiquitous. It is everywhere. It is everything. And so it's really hard to categorize or commodify what you're speaking about. To be fair, switching that word to information doesn't actually make a major difference. You're kind of splitting semantics at that point. But I think it, it denotes a little bit more processing analytics underlying methodology that suggests something has happened that makes this more usable and more trustworthy. Okay. Um, right, Matt, let's talk about um, uh, standardized data infrastructure or data fabric. How essential is it to establish that? So I, I believe it is extraordinarily essential. and I. I I have not moved my vernacular to data fabric yet, uh, but I think particularly in healthcare and in federated or distributed models of healthcare, having a consistent underlying data infrastructure is absolutely core to ensure that we are all working from the same playbook, that we all have access to the same standardized information, that whether we're using it to drive AI or just drive descriptive statistics, we need to make sure that we're building off of the same common building blocks. Um, one of the, actually, I'm going to stop there for a moment and kick it to Alex while I collect my thoughts. Yeah, of course. So, so Alec, when, while we're talking about data fabric, what are the challenges and benefits of establishing that? I think um, the, well, I guess the challenges of actually just getting, um, I guess, the nitty gritty done with regard to understanding where things are and what you've got in your organization through various different legacy systems and, you know, the, the countless times in terms of actually, you know, um, getting involved in terms of driving an initiative or a project, um, and there is no data dictionary to 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 be speak of in terms of actually what you have in an organisation. Um, I think it's it's fundamental to to better understanding actually what you can or uh, can achieve or or, or not achieve um, within within that said organisation. Because if you're going to go and engage with a business. Um, somebody's running a particular process, um, and there's certainly a lot of things that they will see uh, that are hyped up around what AI can do. You, in all, each of those different use cases, when you're driving out, you want to have an understanding of what, actually what have you got to play with um, with an organisation, and actually, you know, what what is near real time as much as you can do. Or, um, but yeah, it's um, I guess in terms of the challenges, it's just it's it's getting you know some good 
guys down on the ground and, and starting to ferret it around and work out actually what is what, what we have in uh, have in that organisation. And and the, the major benefits? Uh, being being able to then deploy more quickly and, and getting things um, out, out into the market much uh, faster. I mean, I think it's, and, and obviously conversely, then getting a bit more of an appreciation of actually what AI can do in the organization and start to drive, you know, a bit more of a, um, I guess, return on that investment. I think too, one of the other benefits in terms of the underlying um, data infrastructure and having solid metadata around your data infrastructure is to be able to identify uh, like your core gaps in your data assets. So at least within the world of healthcare, so we have a million and one legacy systems. We mm -hmm. have data generated for a multitude of different lines of business, and yet it seems every time we want to go deploy something new, that seems to be when we discover that's actually the one area that we don't have any data for. Uh, and so if you have an underlying consistently standardized data infrastructure replete with a data management tool, ideally now located in the cloud, uh, then before you start, yeah, you can actually stop and do a full accounting of this is what we have, this is the, the underlying quality and consistency of this information. It's going to allow us to deploy more quickly or we're actually going to have to fill this gap before we start and not be three months or six months into a POC and realize that you have just spiked your project because the one core piece of information that you absolutely assumed you had you, you do not or you don't have the underlying documentation to be able to describe to the, the external partner or consultant that you're working with what it actually means to use that. Yeah, and, and again, I don't want to keep referencing previous discussions, but um, that is a recurring theme as well, where, where some of these projects get so far down the line and then someone realizes that actually maybe they should have spent a bit more time doing some research or making sure they're actually getting the, the, the data that they, that they require. Um, so staying with data, in terms of uh, actionable data, and I'll go to Matt here first, which is more useful, small data or big data? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna split the audience and say both. Mm -hmm. uh, so in healthcare, in Canadian healthcare, small data is significantly more useful simply because we have not deployed enough wearable tech. We haven't moved into Internet of Things to really be able to benefit from big data. Similarly, we haven't, we haven't enabled enough of an underlying or maybe overhead cloud infrastructure to benefit from big data. So most of our processing is done on-prem. It is done with legacy. Pretty sure somebody referenced a server that was at least 15 or 20 years old. Uh, so by, by virtue of our underlying capabilities, small data is beneficial because it's what we can use right now today. At the same time, when you actually start to think about personalized medicine and going into prescriptive or cognitive analytics, trying to understand what you can do for an individual to ensure a specific outcome, you have to get into the world of big data. So we need to be able to stream real-time information from wearable tech into a cloud and process in real time to be able to understand what I need to do for you in this moment to generate the outcome that we want for you. We'll never get that with small data. Alex, same question to you, really. I mean, do you have a, a preference, if you like, in terms of small data, big data, which is most significant or most useful? Um, it's, it's a journey, really. I, um, I think you know you, you always got to start with the small because that's actually what you've got to hand um, within an organisation, and then you can start to bring bring on um, some of the bigger, wider, wider data um, um, aspects. Um, uh, you know, lot lot of talk around big data, but I think you know, in, in, a, in its entirety, really, if you think about an organisation or general organisation, I do a lot in, in banking, uh, for example. You know. Probably of the data they've got their hands on within uh, potentially within that in, with that organisation is 20% of really what they could actually be using. Um, so I think it's it's really you know to start with a small get those get those things productionized and then start to then go and uh, you know you can then add the other elements of sources to to enrich your your models and, and enrich the effectiveness of what you're deploying. Um, um, I think, but there are cases in point where you are, um, I mean, I've done something recently in, in a London borough where actually the majority of it was big data where we're using, you know, CCTV footage. Um, and, you know, that's where you started to expand out and, and leveraging some of, I guess, the, the roles. It, it's, it's only use case by use case basis, but um, certainly, yeah, start with small and then start to, you know, leverage some of the bigger aspects because it is, you know, it's a journey. 
Okay, right, let's move on to machine learning then. And um, so, Alec, when it comes to machine learning, learning, mm -hmm. how important is it for handling and, I suppose, importantly, cleaning that data? Um, I think, yeah, I've used it quite a lot in terms of helping enrich data. Yeah, so we've got, um, you know, you want to drive a, a more effective um, straight through processing of, of, of a business process. Certainly, it's very helpful in terms of doing that. Um, but I think in, in, in some, of the, some degree, it's also important to understand you know, where, where you've got some uh, frailties in your data. There, there, are, there can be some really golden nuggets in terms of some of the areas where you've got some uh, quality issues. You know, this could be because you know, maybe you've not done the UX on a particular uh, of a digital platform that you've got because people are skipping over or, or just um, not completing um, forms or com completing the in inputs um, appropriately. So that, that's actually, you know, there's, there, there is insight in, 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 in that. But I, I think, you know, um, it's, I guess it's, um, as I see it, it's really around kind of considering the, uh, the, the term that I use quite a lot is um, um, where you kind of, you know, you're balancing the, both the human, human process as well as also the technology. Um, and and it's called, I would say it's all hybrid AI. So how do you best balance those two aspects with regard to actually the different types of tools and technologies you use to drive a business process and, you know, and where, they, where those, and finding those nuggets. But yeah, you can certainly use AI to enrich and do quite a lot of the time just to Im improve um, processing. Okay, and Matt, maybe you can give us some specific examples here of how you've implemented uh, machine learning as well. Um, but can it be used to outsource um, menial, if you like, data management? So resources can be redirected towards value generating activities or, or other activities. Yeah, absolutely. And although I come from a healthcare background, we've actually deployed machine learning via like robotic process automation to generate or to automate aspects of our AR and AP processes. So we, we previously would have employed 20 or 30 accounts processing, or sorry, accounts payable, account receivable clerks to scroll through billings to understand whether or not we had missed revenue opportunities. So again, and sorry to keep lecturing on the Canadian healthcare system, if you are covered by workers' compensation, you've been hurt at work, when you come in, the workers' compensation board will pay for your treatment. Uh, that's a revenue opportunity for us. It's also a very menial and mundane task to scroll through AR billings to try to understand if we in fact got every single WCB bill possible. Training a bot to do that on behalf of somebody else allows those resources to either do more value add uh, work or legitimately reduce the number of clerks that you need and take that money and invest it elsewhere in the system. That's one very small example, but then you can take it to any aspect of routinized data collection, data management, and say, we can train a bot to do this for us, and then I don't actually believe that we need to reduce our workforce. I think that we need to upskill and kind of upstaff, redeploy, and say, now we have 20 or 200 new staff or a compensation for new staff that we can put into a novel area. We can continue to increase healthcare for me, FinTech for somebody else, by allowing bots to do the task that people don't necessarily want to do and don't do well because it is mundane, it is routinized, and after a while your quality starts to slip. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't just sit with ML. I mean, I've just recently used it, you know, computer vision where somebody's doing printing and, um, you know, they've got somebody sat there looking at okay, are we going to be um, uh, getting everything into the margins or it's a business process? Yeah, so you, you know, apply this technology in different spaces to, you know, yeah, it's about, you know, um, you know making sure that obviously there is, there's something that's going to be a benefit, not just for the human um, or the organization, but also for the people who are doing that particular role. But yeah. Okay, I'm going to turn to the audience now. Now, if there are any questions, and preferably something relating to uh, the topic of the conversation, not something where I can throw Matt under the bus, um, we've got a, a question here. And if, if you can start by stating your name and your job title, please. And try and keep the question short if you can, please. My name is Arun Kumar. I'm a principal developer. And my question right now, here are the data fabrics uh, from yesterday and today. I would like to know a bit more on, um, I heard something about the data mesh uh, pattern, the decentralized kind of data. Uh, I would like to know a bit more on uh, how this differs on what's the best way to use, how, what's your thinking behind? Because I hear constantly with the data mesh pattern is a decentralized to add the value. Um, so, the data so the best way to implement data mesh? 
Yeah, I would, I would like to say data mesh is the one I constantly hearing, but the, um, in the recent few months that I heard data fabrics from yesterday and today. That's why I want to know a bit more on um, is uh, for the for to, to, to value perspective as well as for the you know the, the implementation perspective. Whether what could be the best option? Yeah, I mean I think it's getting more and more talked about um, in, in 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 the last few. I mean, in a lot of my recent engagements is the application of the mesh. I mean, I, I guess really the the importance is, is is making sure you've got a better understanding of actually some of the you know the aspects in terms of data that you have in that organisation, and it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a method you can do to to better determine actually what you can use within your organisation. So it's certainly something that should be considered. Um, I think actually is it's it I guess it's still to a, to a certain degree it's something that actually needs to really. Um, be, become more of uh, of, a, of a BAU within within the data teams, um, but yeah, um, it, it's certainly um, uh, something of value. Certainly something that should be considered. Anything to add, Matt? Not really. I think in healthcare, it's the same general idea. It's making sure that we can actually leverage all of the available data assets by having them yeah. harmonized or integrated, ingested into a single common. Either I think I've heard glass pane, I've heard mesh, I've heard fabric. Yeah. Basically enabling it and then enabling it for not just the analytics team, but allowing that self-serve usage for kind of our, our social citizen scientists in the organization. Uh, there's a few more catch terms I'm going to work in in the last two minutes here, but. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, look, I think we're going to leave it there because we're, we've hit four o'clock. Uh, so please join me in thanking Alec and Matt. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs>